joining us this morning. Um, a couple of things I want to ask of folks. If you are new to the call, I want you to be aware that in a couple of minutes, we're going to invite you to introduce yourself. Uh, this is a group of people who started meeting last October, and as time has gone on, we've gotten to know each other better. Last month, we did more thorough introductions all around the team. Uh, this month, we're going to focus on new people coming to the table for the first time. Reminder that this is a Zoom meeting that's being live streamed to the public. The meeting is being recorded. Please be aware of your background noises, mute when not talking. During discussion times, I encourage you to keep your video on as much as you're comfortable to help us get to know each other. Quick reminder, HEART is the team that leverages our diversity to create new solutions so that as we respond to COVID-19, the entire community achieves optimal health and no one is disadvantaged. HEART is the team that extends our solutions beyond public health professionals so that our businesses, our governments, civic associations, human service providers, and others join with health care to change our habits and ways of doing business so that everyone gets to have the best health possible. HEART is the team that uses data, the best information available to us, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, origin, and other relevant identities to understand the harm that's been done, to make strategy, to take actions, and then to measure our progress. Today, we have three big topics to cover. Number one in this is visibility to our Middle Eastern North African neighbors in COVID-19 impact. We're gonna talk about recommendations that a work group has put together that we think should be endorsed by this team. Number two, we're going to return to looking at how we improve vaccine confidence in the community. We're going to hear from Mimi about focus groups exploring vaccine hesitancy. Number three, uh, Chris Hoff is going to join us for an update on COVID-19, and oh my goodness, there, as you know, is so much going on. Uh, so um, we're looking forward to Chris being with us. So let me ask, um, on my screen, I'm not able to see all that are in, but I do want to confirm, is there anyone here who is new or here for the first time? I'm not seeing anyone. So I want to say to everybody who, who's here, then welcome back. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Um, so let's let's go ahead and move into our first agenda item, which is data disaggregation uh, and a work group that's been operating for the last uh, two months to advance our ability in DuPage County to understand who's been harmed in what way and what we need to do about it. I want to ask, uh, so this morning, uh, I, in the last 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes before this meeting started, I distributed um, a document with a summary of this work group's activity and recommendations. And I wonder, those of you who I'm able to see on the screen, if you've received that document, would you give me a thumbs up? Very good. For those of you who haven't, I'm going to uh, drop into the chat a link to a Google Doc, and I think you would be able to find that document there. I'm going to put it up on the screen, so we'll go through it together, but in case you want to have a document of your own to be looking at, I think that Google Doc should take you there. All right, so now I want to ask those of you who have a screen showing, are you able to see my screen with the Heart Technical Work Group for Data Disaggregation document listed. Thanks, Reverend Miguel, appreciate that. So what I'm going to do here is give a very quick background on the work of the uh, work group. What is it that we've done? Who have we talked to? And then I'm going to invite a couple members of our team to talk about their experiences in bringing the Middle East and North African identity into their data collection. Um, and actually now as I'm looking at the group who are here, the two folks we're asking to do that are Asma and Karen, actually I don't see them here. So we may move forward through that. Or Dr. Asfar, I might ask you um, if you're comfortable doing this, 
to share the story of ICNA relief and introducing the MENA category in your most recent event. But if you're not, that's okay. We'll keep moving through anyway. Uh, in real quick background, you will remember that we've been meeting and reviewing data disaggregated by race and ethnicity since we started meeting in October. But we have been missing uh, eyes or visibility or understanding for our Middle Eastern or North African or Arab American neighbors. And so this work group was put together for the purpose of figuring out what action steps we can take to make sure that we bring visibility to that group, which may very well be at heightened risk for COVID-19 and its impacts. I wanna say a special thank you to the members of that group. We've met three times and I wanna hold up uh, Saima Azfar, Mimi Dahl, Jose Gonzalez, Jan Geider, Asma Jarad, Glee Lim, Kara Murphy for their participation in the group, and then Dr. Chug, Nancy Romanchak, and Mila for your support and feedback uh, in between meetings, uh, helping to keep us on track. The group met three times, and essentially we used that time to uh, plan meetings with experts in the area and to review documents and kind of uh, figure out what value they had for us. And I want to hold up three experts in the field that we spoke to that were particularly helpful to us. Uh, that's Mira Nagaz, who is the executive director of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Mira is based in Washington, D.C., but she's got a deep, wide, and extensive network in DuPage County. It was great to get to know her. We visited with Madiha Tarek, deputy director at Access a community health and research center in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, Madiha is an incredible expert at policy and applying it in the community. Shared with us a number of key documents. And we also visited with Nadine Suleiman Neighbor, who is a professor here at the University of Illinois at Chicago in Gender and Women's Studies and Global Asian Studies Program. And Nadine is conducting a study of Arab Americans and racial justice in our region currently. So she's an incredibly important ally for us. We reviewed a number of documents. I'm not gonna go through all of these today uh, with one exception. Um, when we go through the recommendations in a little bit, I'm gonna pull one of these documents up because it, it will be important for our discussion. But you should have these available to you now to uh, move forward in your own organization. Now, before I go into the recommendations themselves, let me stop sharing my screen for a second and see if I can see who all is here. Kara, thank you very much for joining us. And I wonder if Asma, I do not see you with us. Um, let me invite Kara, if you would, you've entered into the world of incorporating MENA identity collection in your data work. Could you talk a little bit about how that's gone for you? What's good, what's bad? Uh, so I, I think, uh, Dave, I'll, I'll take it from two angles uh, and briefly on both. And, and one is to say that um, personally, uh, within the DuPage Health Coalition, this conversation really, uh, uh, rose up for us the, the knowledge that we could and should be doing a better job um, in our own data collection. Uh, we did, in fact, have a category in um, our app, in all of our applications, uh, inviting people to self-identify um, as Middle Eastern, but we were not using the language that, as I've become more um, aware, is um, probably best practice. And so uh, we've been making some amendments just at a micro level within our own organization to try to make sure that um, the categories accurately reflect and give people um, some flexibility about how they wish to, to be defined. Um, but the other thing that we have started doing, and Dave, tell me if you'd rather I talk about this at, at, at the end, is trying to get a better sense of uh, the degree to which uh, our other community partners are on a similar journey. Uh, and so we've uh, drafted a very simple, I, I think it has four questions and SurveyMonkey would say it takes two minutes, um, 
survey that we're asking, uh, that we intend to launch out to all of our health partners out in the community, as well as our nonprofit community partners, as well as our funders, the organizations that oftentimes support each of our organizations to understand how they are um, inviting feedback and, and data on race, origin, ethnicity, and to find out whether or not there's sort of, there's an appetite for um, broader and more inclusive uh, definitions. So we'll have that data collection happening in the next couple of weeks, and hopefully we'll have more to report back on where people are and, and where people are willing to go as well. Very good. Thanks, Kara. That was actually a great introduction. When we go through the recommendations, uh, that, of course, is going to tie in directly. And Dr. Osfar, do you mind if I ask you, so when our committee last met, Asma told the story of Vicna Relief using a MENA origin category for your most recent back to school event. And I, can I put you on the spot? Would you, are you able to talk about that experience? Yes, a little bit, because I was in California and they were planning everything. But uh, due to our work of this group, hearts, efforts, and all the discussion, when the time of back to school program come, we do national program and at very large level um, in 40 states and with thousands of kids. So this year we added that MENA category in our data collection. And uh, it's wonderful to see that how clients and how the families, they were very happy to see that category and they were uh, you know, filling that form. So we started it from uh, earlier this month and these programs have been going. We are distributing backpack supplies and other things. So it's wonderful that we are, we started something from whatever we can do. And, uh, and there was, no one was offended for asking those questions. Everyone was happy. So that's a good thing. Thank you, Dr. Asfar. That's, so that's important. That's our first clue that we're moving in a direction that is supported by the community as opposed to feared by it, or um, although I'm sure there will be different feelings among different people, but um, it's so encouraging to hear that good response. Yeah. I also want uh, folks to know we invited uh, some of our partners from Arab American Family Services to be with us this morning because they've been really instrumental in movement in the state of Illinois so that the state of Illinois' state of Illinois high care high data care collection data. program for vaccination is now including a Middle Eastern and North Africa um, identifier that uh, can be selected by folks who are getting vaccinated. It's been very little used but it has been inserted and it's the advocacy of Arab American Family Services that made that happen. They're not able to be with us this morning, but they also will be very important uh, partners and allies for us as we move forward to do this well. So now let's go through, we have about six recommendations. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Um, a couple of them are kind of slam dunk. That is uh, their obvious steps for us to take. Um, the kind of more, more open for discussion are what we're suggesting that we should be doing here in DuPage. As I go through these, through all of them, whether this is going to be about influence at the national level or the state level or our own activities here in DuPage, I'm asking you to think through as we go through these, how do you see yourself? How do you see your organization entering into these recommendations? because that's the magic, that's the, that's the power that will make this work for us. So the first recommendation is the overall commitment that we ought to be promoting collaboration among policymakers and health systems in DuPage to accomplish a system of data collection reports that is disaggregated by MENA identity. And I'm gonna borrow from the um, research expert, Nadia Abuelazam, uh, to identify, to define this as persons with ethnic, linguistic, or cultural origins to Arabic speaking countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and that live in the US. They are Arab Americans who are likely at increased risk of COVID-19 complications due to xenophobia and discrimination, underlying health conditions, living conditions, 
fragile social networks with limited social support and vaccine hesitancy. So here you see a definition. What do we mean when we talk about MENA and why is this a higher risk that we ought to be paying attention to? Second, we looked at the federal level. Uh, what's the context that we need to be able to do this data collection while here locally? And we have two specific areas that we're asking the federal government for action in. Uh, the first is the US Census Bureau and the Office of Management and Budget. OMB is who sets the categories that are used by the Census Bureau. And we are saying that they ought to include, uh, do a better job of including information about MENA origin and there is a guide for that. Actually, the guide was developed by the Census Bureau uh, in the mid 2000 teens, but it was set aside for the 2020 decennial census. We're saying you need to pick that back up again and get back on track to do an appropriate Middle East and North African identify, uh, identification disaggregation. Number two, the public health legislation, enabling legislation also needs to be updated. So there's a specific Public Health Services Act that needs to be amended to include this. In that way, uh, the federal government will be asking public health systems all across the country for this information. That's a crucial uh, support for us in DuPage. Then we move to the state level and uh, note what ought to be done here to set a context for us to succeed in DuPage. And uh, there is a recommended standard for health data collection, analysis, and reporting that's been put together by a coalition of national organizations that represent many race, ethnicity, and origin groups. Actually, this group did its work building upon census uh, bureau research. It's so it's it's the best science. It's the way we ought to be going. And this is where I want to share my screen and show you a document to see. Ask you about getting yourselves and your own organizations into this. Are you able to see my screen and that says what is the person's race or origin? Nope. No. Okay. So I'm going to stop share, and I'll reshare. How about now? Okay, good, thanks. So uh, this, this standard we're suggesting is what the state of Illinois ought to use when it collects public health data. And it can be applied into other areas as well. You will see that this is a way of collecting data, number one, that empowers the person who's being um, registered or admitted to do the self-identification. That's the first thing. This is not um, an, this is not the federal government making a decision for people. This is people in the community making an identity decision for themselves. That's number one. Number two, um, it's multiple choice. You may select as many categories as fit, and that is what fits our populations today. People have multiple identities and they do not wish to let go of any of them. They do not wish to have to choose um, or choose between inadequate options. Number three, it allows for all of this information to be collected in one form, in one step, as opposed to separating race and ethnicity and requiring that people kind of navigate through two different lenses. Uh, so one sheet, many options, self-identification. And you'll see here in the upper right-hand corner, Middle Eastern or North African is an option that may be selected. And then uh, applicants or persons being identified may print, for example, greater detail for themselves uh, uh, regarding their own identity. So, any, any thoughts about this form? Any reactions? I'm Is it a little much to take in Dave, at one time? I, I, I think that the idea of um, combining um, self-identification of race and ethnicity 
origin into one question instead of two um, makes a lot of sense for a host of different reasons. I am sensitive to the fact that it is a heavier lift to invite not just the combining of that question, but then the inclusion of the follow-up components that are listed here, the, that printing then of another layer of identification. Uh, and so I, 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 don't, um, I don't take exception to the recommendation, but I think that, that it would be a win uh, to see incremental progress here. And David, uh, good morning all. Hi, Jan. Um, as someone whose um, maternal grandmother was um, full-blooded Choctaw nation, um, American Indian is not preferred, but perhaps uh, Native American. Um, I, I know, and I have other friends who are um, of various tribes and they definitely don't wanna be called an American Indian. The American part they're okay with, but the Indian part has a history that um, it is not pleasant. So maybe we could look at using Native American. That's a great point. And also Dave, about the American Indian and Alaskan Native, I feel a little confused when you're talking about the uh, tree, Mayan, Aztec, you know, um, I, I, for example, in Mexico, we never use uh, uh, this origin, you know, we, we are, we say they are uh, like, uh, um, I can remember this. Um, well, we, we, don't, we don't describe like this. I'm, I'm afraid, you know, that they is making confused the people to define what is the, to, uh, to race or origin. I don't know what's the most important. Uh, like, like Hispanic, you know, when you're asking about the, you are Mexican uh, or Mexican-American also. So it depends what you're asking, you know, if it's the first generation, second generation, you know, did they, because they changed the mind and many people becoming confused, you know, where, where who, who I am, you know? <laughs> yes, so, um, and this really sensitive question too, you know? Right. It's a question about to uh, uh, segregate, you know, from your origin, you know. Um, so, but uh, it's interesting, you know, the, how much we need to know or learn about this, you know. A simple question, how much can be affected, you know, to the uh, community. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. it's huge. It's huge. What... Um occurs to me is that so we have with this document we have kind of the start of how do we have a conversation about what would be the better way to go and I'm going to scroll away from this sheet to um, a list of the sponsors of this particular policy recommendation that is this is a group of national organizations that came together and said this is what we want states to do in support of uh, local and, and also to push up toward the, the federal level. So my, my instinct here, Reverend Miguel and Jan, is for us to reach out to Unidos US and the National Congress of American Indians and bring them into the discussion. Let's have a conversation. Uh, let's share with them our concerns and see where they're at with this. Uh, that's number one, so we can pull in um, those research experts who've looked at that. And then number two, um, as you'll see, as we go through the recommendations, um, what we're intending is to set up a conversation in the community about data and identity. And we're proposing that um, our final decisions in DuPage regarding what categories we want to use will rest on, a, on having discussion with the community. So let's put these out there. And if we find out they're inadequate, we won't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make the adjustments that we need to at our level. I really appreciate this feedback. So I wonder, how does that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. This is Nancy. This is really an important uh, 
project that you're working on. And I, I recently graduated uh, with my master's in public health, and we were looking at this topic. And since my mosque community is predominantly South Asian, I was focused on the South Asian population. So the South Asian population in the area where I live has been growing faster than the Latino population in that area. And people who are South Asian don't always know that they fit into the category of South Asian. So we have Nepali, Bangladeshi, Asian American is a big group. Um, but for those um, Bangladesh, Bangladesh population within the Muslim community nationwide is one of the populations that's been growing very rapidly. So that was my concern is that if someone saw this and they say, okay, Asian, they may not know that they fit into that category. They probably would check some other race. I mean, there's a, a way for them to capture it. Certainly this is way better than how it currently is, but I just wanted to throw that idea out there. And Dave, hey, it's, it's Mila. I just wanted to add that there's so many steps to, to this, uh, this area and topic. And some of it is, I love the idea of having a town hall and gathering input because to Nancy's point, the education and awareness has so many different tiers. Part of it is what Kara is doing by looking at the survey work and seeing what um, hospital partners and health partners think. But um, then there's the, the community level experience and knowledge and, and all of that too. So I think Nancy's comments are really important, but um, I wonder if that town hall is also going to gather up much more feedback. Absolutely. And so all three of these perspectives uh, show us how quickly putting something concrete on, on paper does not work well in every community. And so uh, what I'm thinking now is, uh, well, I, I'd sure love for our work group to have a discussion about this. My inclination is to say that we want to continue in the direction of encouraging the uh, state of Illinois to adopt a standard, but acknowledge that we're not yet there to understand exactly what that should be. We've got a starting point, uh, but um, we're not there yet. We need, to, we need to have some community input ourselves before we're able to um, identify exactly what we would like those to be. And let's see if I can get that screen back up again. Forgive me for this messing around. I'm trying to get the, here we go. Are you able to see my screen now? Are you able to see number three to support local communities working for health equity? Good. So one thought here is this, we're going a little too far here by saying this is the standard that we want. Clearly there are concerns about it. Uh, so let us, let us rethink this one a bit and figure out what's the process and the recommendation today and what's the step to get us to a place where there is a standard that the state is using so that we can compare across communities. How does that sound? Okay, some nods. So this takes us to the local level. And uh, we're suggesting here that there needs to be a dialogue between those who are providing COVID-19 related services. And here we're focusing on vaccine and the community members who are coming to get the vaccine and who are responsible for their own self-identification. So we're including the health department, healthcare systems, employers, Lee, you helped us to understand that employers have been a key leader in vaccination in DuPage and elsewhere. Community partners, the retail vaccine providers. So that, though, that group needs to come together with our MENA neighbors to co-develop a data collection process and system. So uh, I see that as a town hall uh, or Mila, uh, that's kind of the overall terminology I'm thinking of, but there, there needs to be conversation between the provider and the community receiving the vaccine about what's the appropriate identity and what's the appropriate way to collect it that will be trusted.
Thoughts about that? I, I like that it's in full agreement. Go ahead. I just wanted yeah. to. Yeah. Oh, it's Mimi. I was just going to say, I like that it, it builds in an ongoing dialogue between the health system and the community to have that back and forth conversation about what works. The health yeah. education part of this um, and the engagement with the health leaders seems like a, a big step for us to move forward to not only build that trust, but understand so much of of the education part that we don't know. So I think this part for us is, is very critical and thank you for specifically including those two things. Chrissy, could you see VNA Healthcare sitting in something like this? Forgive me for putting hey, you Dave. on the spot. It's um, a, it's a... Along those lines with VNA, it makes me think of Illinois Primary Healthcare Association and lifting it to all the FQHCs and folks that um, would have input. I think that's a great idea, Mila. Um, Illinois Primary Healthcare Association, probably the Illinois Association of Free and Charitable Clinics as well. Chrissy's having a sound challenge, Dave. All righty. Forgive me, Chrissy, for putting you on the spot. Really, it's a question for everybody. Could you see yourself entering into this kind of a um, collaboration? All right, I'm going to move us on to number five. Uh, uh, Dave, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was trying to get um, unmute myself. I think the question is, can you see yourself not? becoming involved in this kind of an effort because early on you mentioned, and, and I, I love the fact that you continue to, to connect that there are harms done and, and we can actually use the model of how harms have been perpetuated in let's say the African-American community, uh, the Latinx communities and ask ourselves the question, uh, at what point do we change this paradigm um, and, and recognize that when we are not um, acknowledging, and, and here when we talk about the MENA population, you know, millions of people across our own nation and, and, and identifying them in such a way that we can begin to collect data that drives um, action to improve healthcare. The question in my mind is, how do you not buy into this? I mean, does I mean, does, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. The article that I think we shared uh, that was written by uh, that was published through CBS that featured Arab American Family Services and uh, Itadal and, and Nariman's efforts. One of the things that they highlighted in that in that article was the fact that what, that they got um, so involved specifically in advocacy around data collection and COVID because they were not eligible for funding that was being provided out in the community to support. Um, uh, disparate outcomes or additional supports because there was no data that identified whether individuals um, of Middle Eastern or North African descent were being um, disproportionately harmed. And, and so the, with data collection, um, funds follow. And that is just one of many reasons why we need to do this, but it's one that I think lands for an awful lot of people that, that, um, that, that there's a actual, there are many consequences and uh, that, that our data collection is incredibly important to the ways in which we um, fund and financially support a different future. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks, yes. Chrissy. Thank you. So I had, <coughs> um, excuse me, I had a, um, uh, I'm, I've been having some computer issues. So, um, 
I, I agree with um, with Kara's last statement and, and also with Jan about uh, making sure that we are mindful of the populations that we serve and how they choose to identify themselves. And I think that um, the, the data collection that we have, and it's always difficult um, in, uh, in terms of um, writing the grants and responding to funders and um, uh, stating a case for support uh, when um, ethnicity and race is all intertwined, um, which frequently it is when you're uh, responding to funders' requests, it always makes it difficult. So the more uh, opportunities for accuracy that is based upon um, the majority of the populations that we are serving that, that speaks to how they identify themselves, I think the better. And the, the, um, the, uh, and the comment about bringing in um, the Illinois Primary Care Association and any of the FQHC um, leaders in, in terms of uh, changing and, and uh, expanding the, the data collection points would be um, a good idea so that the more uniform it is, the better, rather than trying to um, make it um, one FQHC at a time. This is Nancy. I, could, I, could I, Chrissy, could I just ask a real quick question? Have you heard anything from collectively among the FQHCs at looking at this sort of data collection or are they differentiating at all? Um, all Not I, I have not at this point, apart from in um, the, um, the committees that I participate in related to, to um, equity and inclusion. Um, so I would have to speak with my colleagues that are um, in our IT and data collection. Um, but I think that if it was happening, I probably would have been hearing about it and I'm not yet. Hi, this is Nancy. I, I'm an active member of the Illinois Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. I'm currently involved with two free clinics um, in, in, on the ground. And I wanted to, first of all, clarify that the free and charitable clinics are different than federally qualified health centers. And free and charitable clinics are more local and more grassroots, often smaller, but we often reach those marginalized populations that aren't being reached because of access in other locations. And I can tell you in trying to use EMRs, the, those electronic medical records are not set up to capture these populations in the way that they should. And even capturing something as simple as religion is not something that the EMR is built in because they want to make sure that people don't discriminate against religion. But from our perspective, it's working against us because we can't capture that religion. So there's that, but, but also, yeah, the EMRs are set up so that when you begin to enter the, the race or ethnicity, you have to enter it three times and it will generally capture, but they're not always correct. They don't always have the ethnicity under ethnicity. It's under race. It's like the people in the IT department who set up these screens are obviously not informed by experts in the field as to what categories should be falling where. So it makes it difficult for clinics who just want to get the work done so they don't often follow through to have the EMR updated to measure those populations. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. We have that challenge. And uh, we do break out um, ethnicity from race, um, but I'm, I find that um, the the predominant um, number of funders that we work with ask for that information um, as if it is all one, which makes it very difficult. You're making judgment about um, which buckets people should fall in when you're reporting to get the outcome of support, the best outcome of support for the population that we serve. Thank you. So the, the creators of the screen, the EMR, that's, or EHR, uh, oh my goodness, uh, that's key. Uh, that's the screen that's got to get through. I think uh, that the, the um, I think it was Nancy that was uh, previously speaking. I think that uh, she has a very valid point that uh, part of this has been uh, related to making sure that people are not discriminated against, but it is it is playing against us when 
um, we are charged with the task of um, demonstrating um, impact to, to people um, that if we have no data to be able to substantiate that. Dave, can I add something? Um, please, please. What, what, I, what I hear, and I, one of the biggest challenges is to uh, uh, define what is identity in this time, you know, what is they're looking for when you try to collect an information. Uh, for people who uh, make this job, you know, uh, there need to be a people, a sensitive people and uh, people uh, understanding the, the uh, culture, the, um, even if he's somebody a Latino, somebody an Asian, you know, they need to know the background of the, the community they, who is asking, you know, but, uh, that way they can have better sense of what he's expecting, the, what the answer he's expecting. Another way that's, that's a general question that they make it so confused. This is exactly what happened in the in the past uh, uh, census, you know, the general questions you make them make it feel people are so confused uh, and really uncomfortable, you know, because they are, they're not sure if they, what are they asking? If we, you are the people who are asking, you know, and they are not sure what is the answer they're going to give. So if you want to collect a, a better uh, data, you know, I, keep in mind this. It's a challenge to find the people, uh, the right people who, who can ask these questions, you know, or collect this information. Uh, but, but just keep it in mind. This is very important. Because uh, uh, I, I remember I, I made my, my thesis about identity in the, in the Episcopal Church. Oh, my gosh. I opened an, uh, a box, you know, with a lot of trouble, you know, because nobody understands exactly what it's about, you know. Especially when when it's coming from a, a, a people of color or Latino, you know, in a white community, it's it's all it's all hard, you know. So just things to keep in mind, you know, to uh, about how we, you collect the information. Make sure you know that the get the right people to get the right uh, the the good answers, you know, and how to interpret even these answers to something important. I can t I can tell you that in our last uh, reporting period. Um, for some of this data, the federal reporting period, um, which was um, en ended uh, at the end of last uh, calendar year, um, we had, um, we, we have um, 70, 74, just over 74,000 patients in this group that I'm, I'm talking about right now, and 18,000 of them uh, refused to report uh, race or um, ethnicity, and I think that that is based upon the fact that they did not want to be discriminated against. They felt that the, the question could lead to their discrimination if they have had that experience, or the categories did not accurately reflect how they identify. So uh, it shows that there's a there's an issue all around if um, such a high number are falling into the category where they where they do not feel included or do not want to answer. Um, uh, Chrissy and, and Reverend Miguel, that is so true. And some of that falling into um, not wanting to answer goes back to people not trusting how the information is going to be used, thinking it's going to be used against them Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is not understanding how data drives treatment, how data, the only way we're going to improve health inequities is if we can collect this data. And, and Nancy, if I might ask, what populations are you serving? Well, in one clinic, it's predominantly South Asian, mostly Pakistani and, and uh, Asian Indian. In the other clinic, it is mostly Arab, Arab speaking even, we have to use a translator. And I, I wanted to add while we're on that thought, you know, my husband is Arab. And so our, our household has been randomly selected the last few years for census. And, and he refuses to answer because the feeling that we're not randomly selected is really pronounced. And the kind of questions that they ask you at the door jump into very personal questions. So it's really unclear who this is knocking on our door, asking really personal questions because we've been randomly selected. Again, you know, it does feel very much like being targeted. And um, so then, you know, my husband chooses to opt for privacy so that data doesn't get collected. And here am I in public health. But I totally understand, I totally understand his position because I have the same feeling. 
you know, because of the way it is, you know, you get the snack on your door and here's a woman wearing a turban, <laughs> probably to look like she's Arab, <laughs> you know, and you just like right away, it puts you on guard rather than making you feel comfortable to answer these questions. I think that um, there's, there is a big opportunity um, to Jan's point about people not understanding and, and automatically feeling that this, and, and automatically rightly so, because th they have had historical experience often with data being used um, against them as opposed to um, being a, a useful tool to serve them. But I think that um, we have an opportunity um, to try and find some way to message this so that people do understand what are the benefits? Why do people ask these questions if you when you go to the doctor and and how or to any health clinic and and why should you why is it in your best interest to answer? How does that help public health? I think it would be really interesting to to have some mechanisms, social media, just like we're doing with COVID vaccine hesitancy, that, that helps explain that to people. Christy, thank you. And I'm gonna add, Sarah has also raised a similar point um, in the chat regarding the uh, amount of distrust around classification. So it sounds to me pretty clearly like we need a, a recommendation that pulls out this question of building trust and educating the community about the value and the benefit. So I'm gonna suggest that we do that. We're, we'll come back with uh, a revised, I'm gonna suggest we do that, come back with a revised list and include a recommendation that deals specifically with that building understanding and trust. And there are other things that have been discussed here today that we'll uh, weave into this such as we're not yet settled on what that statewide standard should be. We need some discussions here regarding the meaning of these specific, um, or what's the best presentation for specific identities. I'm gonna, I wanna bring us to a close now because it's important that we move into a look at the focus groups right now. We're about um, 10 minutes behind in our agenda. So I wanna hand off to Mimi to bring us up to date on building our knowledge base on building vaccine confidence. Hey Dave, yeah. before you do that, could, if there's a meeting of the subcommittee coming up, um, I, I'll do a better job of sharing it ahead of time so people can know to join. But if you have a date and you wanna throw it out, um, we can put it in the chat or something. Mm -hmm. We don't have a date. We've been, what we've been meeting is Mondays at 11 a.m. So I probably would aim for, um, the, uh, the not this coming Monday, but the Monday following. So let, let me confirm that with our members right after this meeting, and then I'll get you a date. I'll, I'll move on that quickly. Thank you. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I can be quick. I know time is of the essence today, but I wanted to just update folks with where we're at with our focus group efforts so far. Um, and just a reminder, we're piggybacking off the survey work we had already done. Um, and following up with three focus groups to dig deeper into communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID. So we will be doing a focus group with the Black and African American community, the Latinx community, and the MENA Arab community. Um, first, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that I've met with already and has shared their time and insights. It's a lot of people who have been at this table um, in terms of talking through what these groups will look like and helping plan for them and getting recommendations on who we should reach out to um, as, we, as we plan this work. So thank you so much for that. Um, at this point, we have our materials developed and we're getting um, some of it translated at this point. We have dates for two of our focus groups so far. Um, the Latinx, uh, it'll be a Spanish language group. Uh, we just settled on these yesterday, so I will be updating folks that I've talked to um, September 8th at 6 p.m. That's a Wednesday. And then the Black and African American focus group, we will uh, be scheduling for September 9th, also at 6 p.m. So folks can um, expect to see some contact from me and also flyers and materials like that to reach out to folks. Um, the MENA Arab group, we are still reaching out to more people and we are hoping to set that one soon as well. 
Um, so we're moving along and that's really where we're at so far. So hopefully um, when we have our next group, we'll be able to report out some preliminary findings on where we're at. Um, Thanks, Mimi. Mimi. Um, do you yeah. already have participants for the focus groups? We don't yet. So that's where the flyers and the outreach will become really important. Those should hey, be going out I, hopefully this following week. I have some people for you. Okay. Right. I was like, oh my gosh, right. you already when you when you made that announcement, I was like, oh my gosh, she's already no, got the no. To be honest, like we will just be starting outreach and recruitment. The earliest will be next week, so that should give us two to three weeks to really um, put stuff out into the community and reach out to folks and get a group. We're hoping to have about eight to ten people participate in each group, and typically we oversample because we know you know things come up and sometimes people can't attend. So we'll probably ask for about twelve people to sign up for each group. Okay. I, I, I received a call a couple of nights ago from a media person here in Naperville, and he wants to help us. In fact, he says, why haven't you reached out to me yet? I'll oh. share his name with you off, 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 of, an, uh, off of this. But he's, he's returning to the area on Tuesday, and uh, he wants to help you know, help us get this focus group because he believes it's important uh, to help us get the, the focus groups planned. But I also have another person who um, who is trying to get some people in her company, her school, to be part of the focus group. So I would reach out to her today. And you said September 9th? Yes. Okay. I have to check my notes to make sure it was the right date for the right group, but yes. <laughs> right. And I, I may also have some members of our MENA community who are interested. So if you can get a date, set a date for that one, I can start reaching out to them and seeing if, if I can get a few to commit. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Feel free to circle back with me offline. That would be amazing, Jan. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mimi, and all who are helping to make that happen. Absolutely. Hey, I want to invite now Chris uh, to provide a COVID-19 update. Chris, good to see you again. Hey, Dave, how are you? Good. All right. And hi, everybody. Thanks for letting me join again today. Uh, can you see me? We see a blank blue screen. Yeah, that's all I see, too. Huh. <laughs> Okay, well, I might be audio only. Let me try one more thing here. There you are. Okay, cool. Better to be visual as if you're going to be on Zoom, right? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for allowing me to give an update today um, on vaccine distribution and um, where we stand with the current situation of COVID. Uh, obviously, very different than the last time we met and uh, continues to change almost every day. Dave, can you confirm you're seeing a full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I think I've met almost everybody on the call. If, I, if we haven't met, I'm Chris Hoff. I'm the Director of Community Health Resources uh, at the DuPage County Health Department uh, and integrally involved in our COVID response. So thanks again for the chance to give an update. So I'm gonna start with a um, kind of situation update because I think as we talk about uh, the continued importance of vaccine and the preventive measures that really need to be in place now, as schools go back, as people are back out in the community, as people return to work settings, um, it's really important to understand what COVID looks like today and how that might be different from the spring so that we can protect those in our community um, that are at the highest risk. Um, and we know that um, we have populations that have suffered a disproportionate burden of, of impact from disease um, and death, and we wanna do everything we possibly can to prevent that going forward. Uh, and it's easy to be sort of complacent now, right? We feel like, okay, this has got to be over now, right? We've got to be getting close. We all felt at the health department for sure back in June, um, even part of July that like, wow, okay, we may be turning the corner here. We may be done. We can go on vacation. We can start to go back to family events. We can go back to school safely. Um, but things have really changed substantially. And so I just want to kind of walk you through that and give you the tools and information to help communicate to those uh, that you work with why it's so important to continue to take steps to protect yourself, uh, starting with getting vaccinated, but then some of the other strategies that we know are effective. So I'm gonna start here with just two pictures. This is a map of the US as of July 12th. 
Uh, CDC has four different categories of the level of disease transmission, low, moderate, substantial, and high. Um, blue is best, that's low. Um, high is worst, and that's red. Uh, and so a month ago, you can see the country was looking pretty good. There were hot spots, of course, in the, the central part of the U.S. and down south. We knew we were starting to see more cases there, um, but certainly around Illinois, uh, there were days when we were in low transmission here in DuPage County. Now jump forward uh, just a month and you can see how dramatically transmission has changed across the country. Uh, and we've gone from pockets of red or, or areas of red to really the entire country being on fire with a high level of community transmission. Uh, and this is why it's so important right now um, as we talk about vaccines and preventive measures and really helping people understand um, why this is different than it was a month ago um, that they understand the level of transmission that's going on. So you can see here that transmission has just jumped across the country. Um, and there's some stat that I will pull and, and put in the chat, but uh, greater than 90% of the U.S. population is now in a county that's experiencing high community transmission now, which is unbelievable um, given where we were even a month ago. Um, here in Illinois, the situation is no different. A month ago, uh, many of the counties in Illinois were yellow or blue. We were starting to see some uh, areas in Missouri. You saw stories about St. Louis um, experiencing a high level of hospital admissions. Iowa counties were starting to see a lot. Uh, and now here in DuPage, we're back into this high level of community transmission, uh, which is really unfortunate and hard to, hard to swallow, right? We, were so, we felt like we were so close a month ago, um, but this is why it's so important now that we continue to help our, our, um, our friends, our family members, our coworkers understand the steps that they can take and should be taking to protect themselves. Um, from COVID so that we can bring transmission back down again. Uh, and you can see on the right here, uh, the changes in cases are up 34% just in the past seven days. Um, new hospital admissions are up 42% in the last seven days. And this is for DuPage County specifically. Um, so we're seeing significant changes, not just in cases, but also in hospital admissions. Uh, thankfully, at this point, we haven't seen that uh, dramatic jump in, in deaths. So we know vaccines are working, but we also know that hospitalizations and deaths tend to lag new cases by a couple of weeks. So we need to do everything we can to bring transmission back down uh, to really prevent us from getting into that situation where we have high numbers of hospitalizations and deaths again. Um, statewide, um, the state has, has been posting and you've got links to all these things here to monitor yourself, but you can see that across the state, uh, cases we know have gone up, new hospital admissions have gone up, hospitalizations are up, um, and daily mortality across the state is starting to go up if you look at that trend. Um, so this is another pivotal point in time in our COVID response to really help protect those around us. Um, here in DuPage County, um, very specifically on our dashboard, and you've got a link here, I won't go through the whole dashboard this morning unless there's questions or you wanna jump out to that. Uh, this is cases by day. Um, and this starts the right side, left, left side of the chart is mid April. Um, so as schools were, were starting to wind down for the year and we were getting more and more vaccines out there, one of our highest levels of vaccine delivery months was April. Uh, we know the vaccines were starting to get out to folks and we started to see the impact of that in transmission and really starting to come down uh, very, very demonstrably. Uh, this is very small, but on the left side, the, the number of cases per day was about 280 cases per day back in April. We bottomed out. We had days, I think, with nine cases per day being reported um, in the middle of June, uh, beginning to middle of June. That felt incredible. We felt like, wow, this maybe maybe this is it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we've seen transmission rise. We've seen the proportion of cases um, related to the Delta variant um, really take on greater and greater proportions of all cases. And our numbers now, unfortunately, are surging again. And we've had several days in the past week um, with over 200 new cases per day being reported here in DuPage County. Uh, the picture in our hospitals uh, is also concerning. Um, this chart looks at the number of people admitted to our six hospitals in DuPage County every day. Um, every day, the hospitals report a snapshot in time for the number of people they currently have in the hospital, either in the ICU or non-ICU. Um, on July 12th, on the left side here, we had 12 people in the six hospitals across DuPage County. We had 12 people hospitalized for COVID and zero in the ICU, nobody in that blue bar. Um, jump forward 30 days and we've got 95 people in the hospital with 14 in the ICU. Um, that's really a significant change. Um, that puts pressure on hospitals, not just from the COVID burden, but also for all those other diseases and illnesses and acute traumas that people experience. Uh, if they need that level of care to be in the hospital, we don't want our hospitals and healthcare workers to be overwhelmed with COVID 
while they're trying to take care of all of the other conditions that we're generally working on trying to prevent and limit in our community. Uh, so we are seeing this rise in, in hospital utilization as well. Uh, in terms of the Delta variant, lots of questions that we get, and I'm sure you're getting too. So I put two, two useful uh, things here. The one on the left is probably the most helpful. Uh, there's a link on the bottom there to CDC's kind of overview of the Delta variant and why it's so important to understand that the COVID picture today is very different than it was a month ago and very different than it was six months ago. And that's really because of these variants and in particular the Delta variant. Um, we know that the Delta variant is highly contagious and, and nearly twice as contagious as previous variants. So the, the, the issue and the most important thing to know is that before if we had somebody get sick, they might have passed that on to one or two people. Now that could be four to five people. And so the explosive nature of this can really extend quickly because people are more likely to be infectious to more um, people around them. So as they're going back to school, they're going back to work settings, they're going back to faith communities. Um, we sort of got comfortable going back to these events and now we have a very different picture with what COVID, the, the virus uh, and the strain of the virus that causes people to get sick. Um, we know that um, some data suggest that Delta can be more uh, severe, can cause more severe illness. So as people are thinking about getting vaccinated, uh, the reason you might have gotten vaccinated six months ago um, now has really changed. Now we know that we have these strains that are causing higher levels of severe illness. It's really important to get vaccinated. And that is the number one thing that people can do to protect themselves and those around them. Um, and fourth there, what, what's really um, concerning, and there's still more data coming out, is that um, we're finding that it appears that people who are fully vaccinated um, can become infected with Delta and may be able to spread that to others. So you saw in the past two weeks, the change from CDC to recommend uh, face masks for everyone, even if you're fully vaccinated when you're in an area that has substantial or high transmission. And that definitely applies to us here in DuPage County. Uh, so we are recommending that people get those masks back out. Even if you're fully vaccinated, if you're going out to a crowded place, a public setting, um, you should be wearing that mask to protect not only yourself, but those around you and to bring down transmission for all of us, um, especially for those people who aren't vaccinated. And really remember in this, this group, I'm so, I'm so grateful to work with this group of people because I think you all understand that there are people that may not be able to be vaccinated. There are people for whom vaccines don't work as well. So it's not just a choice of protecting myself, we're also in this to protect those around us uh, who may be more vulnerable to this disease. Um, the chart on the left is a CDC chart that shows the proportion of cases made up by the different variants. And all I'll point out here to you is the orange slice um, is the uh, Delta variant. So of all the cases identified, or the orange bar shows you what proportion is from Delta. Back in May, um, less than 5% of new COVID cases were caused by Delta. Um, in the most recent week, um, we're estimating that over 90% of new cases are caused by Delta. So Delta is here. Um, it's definitely in uh, our region. It's definitely in our state and it's definitely in DuPage County. So in terms of what do we do about it and what do these community transmission levels mean? And I think this is important as we talk to people about why we're increasing mitigation measures and conversely in weeks, how we can get out of this and what's the off ramp. Because I know we need to give people some sense of like, this doesn't have to be. We were in a period where we were at low transmission and we will get back there, um, but we're not there right now. So as we're in red, this highest level of transmission in, in DuPage County and across the country, uh, we really need these significant measures to limit uh, contact between people, really try to prioritize activities that need to take place. We want students to be back in school. We want people to be able to go to workplace settings where they need to be. Um, and so if there are opportunities to skip um, uh, some gatherings or to avoid being in crowded indoor places, now is the time to do that. And it is okay. And we wanna help people understand that it is good and it is a wise decision. And we fully support you if you say, you know, I'm not gonna have that big gathering this week. I'm not gonna have that big birthday party. We're gonna scale back our faith service this week or for the next few weeks until we get to lower levels of transmission. There are definitely things that people can be doing now to protect themselves uh, and their friends, colleagues, coworkers, um, faith community members. Um, we talked a little bit about the change to the indoor masking guidance. Um, hopefully you all have seen this. And I think again, here too, helping people understand why we might want people to wear masks, even if they're fully vaccinated. The situation is very different than it was a month ago, very different than it was six months ago. Uh, we all thought that if everybody got vaccinated and we had high levels, um, you could stop wearing masks and it wouldn't be a big deal. 
the science is evolving, the data we're collecting about these Delta infections is changing, and we know that masks can continue to be a really important way to stop transmission, and they work immediately, right? There's very few things we can do today that cut down on transmission in the next five minutes, and masks are one of those. So please help us to share that message with people that this continues to be a really effective tool that we can give people um, to help protect themselves and those around them. Um, just, just so you are aware, we are finding a Delta variant in DuPage County. Um, these uh, three that are B.1.617.1.2.3, um, there is about 60, let's see, that's 70 cases of Delta that have been identified here in DuPage County. Um, we don't always know whether cases of Delta are identified or not. People don't find out whether they have Delta and it really shouldn't matter to an individual what they have, um, but we want to be clear that we are finding Delta here in DuPage County. It's here, this is not something like, well, that's the problem somewhere else. Uh, we are finding these cases here in DuPage County. Chris? Yeah. Um, I remember from uh, seeing that slide before, what is the time period of that, that slide? Because it's kind of relevant in terms of proportion. Yeah, so this is uh, cumulative data, and this goes back uh, to earlier in 2020. So we've been working with IDPH to try to split out some better data about what's happening uh, recently. Uh, we know that the proportion of Delta is rising, so we'll be able to share some better data about what it looks like today versus what it looked like six months ago. Um, in general, though, the proportion of, of Delta being identified is increasing, um, and only a small number of, of specimens are actually sampled to find out what strain they are, just enough to give us a sense of what's out there. Um, and so, yeah, it's a great question, Kara, and we'll be able to provide some better data about, you know, what it looks like in the last two weeks, or the last four weeks compared to overall. Chris, Any other quick question? Is, is yeah. the regular test identify the Delta right away, or they need to a special test to know if it's a Delta? Yeah, it's a special test. So when you get tested for coronavirus, you get a result that says you either found coronavirus in your specimen or not. Um, if it is positive, it can then be sent on for genomic sequencing and it takes a, another test. It takes special laboratory expertise to be able to do that. So not every specimen is um, subtyped. Uh, that's what that's called to find out what strain it is. Uh, we're generally doing that for surveillance. So for some percentage of all positive results are being sequenced to find out what's here. Uh, and then we're also using it in outbreak settings to find out if everybody in this outbreak has the same strain and therefore got it from the same person or place, um, or whether they're all different and people have different exposures. So it is a different test um, and that result doesn't come back to the person. So you won't know that you have Delta, or you have Gamma, or you have Alpha. What's most important is that you have coronavirus and you need to isolate and stay away from people for that, that period of time. It's a great question. Chris, this might be out of your, um, your bandwidth, but what will it take for the recommendation, at least as you know, we enter public spaces like markets or grocery stores, what will it take for the recommendation to turn into a, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, mandate that people who are entering uh, these public indoor spaces should wear a mask. Yeah, so the mandate, you know, the quickest thing is businesses or, or um, organizations making that decision and requiring it themselves. So many places are um, asking that people wear masks. I go to places, I picked up shoes at a store the other day that were being fixed and they said, you gotta wear a mask to come in. So there are many things in our power. In our power, the, those of you on the phone have the power to make decisions to do that. Um, at a population level for the, the state, right now the state has mandated that masks be worn in schools. Um, and so there are tools at the state to mandate that um, and some enforcement through the State Board of Education. Uh, what gets tricky, of course, is a, is a enforcement tool. So to go from a recommendation to a mandate often requires you to have some sort of penalty for people that don't. Um, and we don't necessarily have those tools um, at, um, at the county level for sure to enforce the use of masks. So we're strongly recommending, we wanna help businesses understand that there are individual choices they can make. Um, uh, schools have been directed and are being um, told that they must do that or risk the licensure through the State Board of Education. Does that answer that, Jan? Uh, it, it does, except I would like to see grocery stores. I mean, I, I walked into I think it was Whole Foods yesterday or the day before, 
and some of the employees had masks on, some did not. And I thought, and there, and the sign is just that it, it recommends mm -hmm. that people who are vaccinated as well as those who are not uh, recommends that they wear masks. And that's, that's okay. But I would, I, I'm thinking the store employees should wear a mask to mm -hmm. help protect those of us who choose to wear a mask. It, it can, is something like that reasonable to, uh, from a county level to require our grocery store uh, personnel to wear masks? Um, it's a recommendation that we fully support that people wear masks. We're in high transmission. It would absolutely be under the CDC recommendation. At the county, we don't have a mechanism to enforce or require that people wear masks. Uh, and so the state you know, had a statewide mask, mask mandate previously. We would be supportive of, of people wearing masks when we're in this level of high transmission. Uh, we encouraged schools to do that before the state required masks. We were telling school districts that we fully recommended, fully endorsed, strongly encouraged them to wear masks in school, especially at the start of the school year. Um, and that's the extent of the, the authority that we have at the county level to do that. Uh, so wherever we can encourage people to, to do it and to take that power where they have it themselves, we would want them to do that. And would ask for your help, right? So we can, the places that we patronize, the places that we support, the places we work, um, we have a lot of influence in those places to say, hey, I think we should require masks until we get out of this high level of transmission or until we get back to blue. Uh, and that is an area we can use a lot of advocacy because you all know there's a lot of uh, sentiment that we don't need masks and we did what we needed to do to avoid wearing masks and we don't want to go back to that. Uh, and so we definitely need the support on that. You have seen that go down in flames where people have said, well, we're just going to mandate it and you have tons of pushbacks. We really need to build that grassroots support for this as a tool to protect those around us. Um, I have a question. This is Nancy. Our, you know, um, mask communities, we continue to recommend that everyone wear masks all the time. We have been social distancing prayer since the restrictions came down. People have been praying shoulder to shoulder again. I imagine we'll probably be shifting back again with the high levels of Delta. But we are toying with the idea of requiring everyone who enters the mosque to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, but I think as a religious institution, I think we can make that requirement because we follow different restrictions as a, as a faith community. But I'm not sure. That's one of my questions. Can we require that? And the other question is, um, if so, you know, we didn't want to ask people who is vaccinated and who isn't because we didn't want to impinge on privacy regulations or anything like that. But now we're thinking we're going to try to get the mosque community up to at least 70 percent vaccinated. In order to do that, we have to know who is vaccinated and who isn't. So is it are we OK to be asking people? And what is your opinion about requiring it for a mosque community? Yeah, it's a good question for faith communities. So businesses and employers, uh, it's very clear, can require uh, employees to be vaccinated. Um, for your faith communities, it's probably good to look at your, you know, if you have legal counsel to ask them what the conditions are, if you need to be able to make exceptions, if there's somebody that can't be vaccinated uh, or chooses not to be, um, to avoid any sort of discrimination issues. Um, but definitely asking people if they're vaccinated, putting out recommendations that you want people to be fully vaccinated or have been tested uh, pre prior to them coming to your event, uh, there are lots of, of different places that are doing that. You've seen businesses, you've seen um, concerts. I know some communities are choosing to go that route um, for workers or for staff um, in community settings. So it's absolutely something we would support uh, looking at as a way to increase vaccine vaccination coverage and to protect those around you. Uh, but you do probably want to check with whomever gives you that guidance about your um, your policies to make sure that you're in line with anything that might be required. I don't know enough about your, your situation to say, yep, absolutely do it. And I want to be careful about that. Thank you. Okay. I'll give a couple of updates on vaccine. I'll, I'll post these slides in the chat and then send them out through the group because I know we've just got a few minutes, Dave, and I'll try to be done here by 1020. Um, we have continued to make tremendous progress in, in getting our population vaccinated. Um, there are about 790,000 people who are eligible to be vaccinated who are over the age of 12. Um, at least 664,000 of them have been vaccinated, uh, which is fantastic. It gives us a very high level of protection. 
Um, but also very important to know that that's not everyone. And so, the, you know, we get a lot of questions about like, well, DuPage has such a high rate of vaccine. How can we possibly be seeing all these cases? Um, if you look at our look at our population numbers, there's 922,000. I think I saw the official new census number is 932,000 people. Um, that still means that we have 250,000-ish people who are not vaccinated, who are under the age of 12 and can't be vaccinated, um, who are 12 and up and have chosen not to be, who are 12 and up and have decided that it's not the appropriate decision for them based on their condition. Um, that's a quarter of a million people here in DuPage County that are not vaccinated, um, some by choice and some because it's not available to them. So that's why we need to be so um, careful about taking preventive measures now to protect those people. Uh, and to help those who are eligible to be vaccinated get the answers to the questions they need about vaccine to make that decision. Um, but we know that that zero to 12 group has no protection from vaccine and is not eligible yet. And that's a group we're very keen to protect. Um, vaccine uh, numbers are going up. So in the past month, we've seen about 45,000 doses administered. So we are still seeing vaccines administered. Uh, the chart on the bottom here, you can see a jump in vaccines uh, towards the end of July. So we have seen some more interest from people being vaccinated um, as the situation has changed. So please do use this data to help people understand why it's so important to get vaccinated. I'm gonna skip some of these and I'll give them to you in the, um, the slide deck. I wanna highlight for you that yesterday we learned that IDPH launched uh, the availability of some data about vaccination status by zip code. Um, so this is a tool we've talked about in this group and have been working to try to get out of IDPH. Um, you've got a link at the top of the slide here for how to access that. We haven't had time to really validate this, um, so it's available through IDPH. I would encourage you to check it out. It will show you the, the percent of the population in each zip code with one dose administered and those fully vaccinated. Um, you can see on the right side here that we look pretty good here in DuPage. We're you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent across our communities, which is tremendous, um, but we probably still have pockets. We know there are pockets of individuals out there that may not have yet been vaccinated. So please check this tool out. We'll be able to talk more about it the next time we meet, but dig into it. If you have questions, you identify good or bad, uh, let us know. We're excited this is finally available. Chris, we might ask, hey, Evan, can I put you on the spot for a second? Have you looked, have you seen this by any chance? I wonder if it resonates true with you, but if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, we'll just keep right on moving. This is the first time seeing it, so I'll okay. dig into it. Um, in terms of our populations being vaccinated, I'll just highlight here, this is um, this may not have changed since the last time that we met, um, but you can see the comparison of the percent of our vaccine recipients against the, the composition of our, our census. Um, we're very close in some of these populations uh, in terms of being able to get those individuals fully vaccinated um, and still have some outstanding ga da gaps in the data about ethnicity from the data we're seeing from IDPH. So we still need to make efforts and headway to get everyone vaccinated that is eligible. Um, and we'll continue to, to get this data to you to help inform your efforts. And I'll, I'll share all of these in the slide deck and we can talk more about it uh, if there's questions or later on. Uh, for 12 to 17 year olds, I think just important to highlight for you all as we talk about um, mitigation measures in school, this bottom bullet here, um, that of those who are school aged children in DuPage, um, only about 24% are fully vaccinated. So over 75% of our students in DuPage County are not fully vaccinated. Uh, do not enjoy that protection, which is why these mitigation measures in schools are so important, especially as that we're really high transmission. Uh, the care van is out um, and we're happy to bring that to you or work with your organization or anybody else to bring vaccines when people are interested. Uh, this group is very busy. Uh, they're out two or three times a day at different events. Uh, and we've administered about 500 vaccines through this effort. Um, and you've got a link in the slides to request that if you haven't brought that to your community. Um, we've been at grocery stores, libraries, schools, um, we'll be at a trampoline park today. Um, we'll be at Pakistani Independence Day on Saturday. Any option is a good option, and we're happy to work with you to bring that there. Uh, and the last thing that I'll end on, because I know we're short on time, Dave, is boosters. Um, you saw last night, everybody, that uh, the FDA announced that they had authorized additional vaccine doses for certain immunized, immunocompromised individuals. Uh, that's the first part of this decision. The second occurs today with the CDC's advisory community immunization practices, really defining who's eligible. What do we mean by immunocompromised? What individual should have this third dose at what interval? Um, who, who should get it and when? That information will be coming out today. And so we expect by next week to have more information for those in our community who are uh, immunocompromised who might benefit from this third dose. So more to come, but this is late breaking. So I wanted to get it up in front of you today.
and I'll stop there, Dave, because I know we're short on time, but I can take questions or follow up and I'll post slides in the chat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris, as always going through an incredibly dense amount in a brief time. Questions, comments, conversation. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at the zip code data because we just ourselves became aware of it really recently. So if the communications group that's been coming together wants to dig into it a little bit, um, I'm happy to organize something with, for that. I know we will use it for the um, social media and other digital campaigns we're doing. We have a campaign going on right now. Um, so we can adjust that campaign based on the zip code information. So. Um, we'll definitely you know. use it to identify where we want to focus our event scheduling too. It's really exciting to see it. Yeah, and there are differences. I mean, you, you know, they're not, it's not uniform. Yeah, this is Nancy. We, I became aware of it a couple of weeks ago, right before I had a focus group at Al Farouk on the Southwest side, where cases are very high and vaccination rates are very low. And it was such a useful tool because you can pull it up and you can show them exactly where their neighborhood sits and the number of vaccinations and compare it to the COVID cases. And at that time, the most recent data out was that 99% of new cases were unvaccinated people. And here was a perfect illustration to show that it completely matched the data on that um, zip code zoom in. So it was really exciting that everything came together to, to educate people about how to how the vaccine really was affecting the numbers and why in your area, why in your neighborhood are people not getting vaccinated when they could? And so it flipped it around rather than mistrust. It became about I'm entitled to get vaccinated. You know what I mean? It's a really a great tool. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Just huge. Nancy, that's a really helpful illustration that if we can find ways to put that data in front of people, it will it will do the lift. It will carry the power to, to flip people's thinking. And, and Dave, you know? I um, just going back to the communications group coming together, I, I sort of feel like it's not just about telling people you live in a community that isn't, you know, doesn't have a vaccination rate that's great or, you know, things like that. I, I and bringing events there, you know, we need to get into a little bit more on how to build some more trust in those communities around it. Cause I, I feel like there's a lot of vaccine opportunities. So it's not just that barrier. So I'll get a date out for communications. Thank you. And I think uh, Chris, I wanna say that your presentation also that data presentation regarding the resurgence of transmission is a stunner. Uh, so I, that's an incredible tool also for us to take out to leaders in our networks to get the attention of people who have many, many um, recovery activities in front of them and, and may be distantly aware the transmission is up, but it's a, it's a stomach punch to look at that presentation. It's a mind changer to say, oh my goodness, I got to pay attention here. And so thank you. Chris, can I, can I just ask you about um, the confidentiality of the slides that you left? I, I just caught on the last slide that there was um, something that had confidential written on the bottom of it. Are we, are we able to share this with our um, service uh, colleagues our, in our organizations? Which one is that? I, it was right at the end, if not maybe the last one. Uh, I don't recall anything. Right at the bottom on the like the left hand side, said something. I just caught confidential as it disappeared. I'll double check. The intent Chris, is it, it to might be the it might be the race and ethnicity graph slide. I'm just having this memory in my head of of the mm. the red font in it, but I'm not sure. We didn't really look at that one, but it might actually have been what Chrissy was seeing. Oh yeah, um, that does say that is the vaccine recipient data from eye care. Um, that does say confidential data, but these in this context is okay to share that. We want you to have that. We want people to be aware of it. It is data we've analyzed and Dr. Chuk's team has has reviewed. So yeah, any slide in here is okay to share. To share with um, the our peers or to share also with the community. Can we use some of these slides, not that one, but some of these slides to share with the community? Absolutely. 
Yes, please do. <laughs> and you. if there's something else you need, let us know. We're happy to pull it together. No, that's excellent. I'd like to send this out to our advisory board just so that they're aware. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Is there any change in the guidelines? Like, you know, we, we were hearing that it's okay to meet 50 people can gather and, uh, you know, events are okay. So is there any change from uh, county? There's no okay. change in that right now. Officially, Illinois is still in the, the um, phase five. So everything's kind of reopened. Um, but just because the rules are permissive, I think doesn't mean you have to do that. And I think that's one thing we want to help our communities understand is that it is absolutely okay um, and probably a good idea to take steps to limit transmission, especially as we're seeing really high levels of transmission right now. Um, we're at the highest level and we're continuing to go up. So now is the time, if you have control over your gatherings, you know, if you don't need to meet in person, don't meet in person. If you don't need to be, you know, two feet apart, spread out. If you can be outside instead of inside, be outside. So the rules have not officially changed, but we're all smart people and we want to help our friends and family members and coworkers make good decisions. So absolutely okay to take steps to protect yourself now. Great question. Are you, are you seeing anything uh, at the state level? Um, the the uh, IDPH and um, the governor were having the um, very frequent briefings. Are you, are you seeing any likelihood that they are going to move this level or just not yet? We haven't seen anything. It's not to say that it won't happen. I think the, the decision um, by the governor and by the state to require masks in schools was one indication that they're, you know, they're looking at and willing to take steps to protect people. I haven't heard anything in terms of restrictions or going backwards um, or changing those levels, but I do think we want to be looking at those and, you know, we might want to be advocating for um, some measures that make sense to protect people, um, even without a, a statewide requirement. So what should we do? Like I'm thinking we recently saw in the news that Lollapalooza had, you know, there was thousands and thousands of people were gathering, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's very important that all of us, you know, pay attention to our own institution. But it seems like a tsunami. It seems like, you know, like it's a flooding of uh, uh, Delta variant. And we really need to, one at one uh, side, which you're saying, I think we should really, you know, uh, try to, make ourselves, our homes, our institutions uh, safe. But at the same time, it's the contagious uh, uh, nature of this Delta variant is, requires that we have to shout now. I think maybe we can, we can talk to, the, I don't know what, to, what, what needs to be done, but we need to share this frustration that there should be some guidelines should be changed now. Because this this slide which you showed like completely right, I was looking. Is it in Illinois? Is it in DuPage County? Is mm -hmm. it like are we going back to that place again? We had done so much, all of us. So when you look from, if you look from state level, also that the at uh, the DuPage County is is leading the way in vaccination. So if you think everybody else is is likely to be worse, mm -hmm. that's really very alarming. Yeah, I think, I mean, Dave's, Dave's words are right on. It's a stomach punch, even to, to me. You know, we all felt it like we, we were going to get a break. You know, it's been 20 months. Let's all take a breather. And now we're right back where we are. And I think it takes a minute for people to catch up and say, well, wait a minute. I, I thought we were done. I thought you said when vaccines got to this level, it would be gone. I thought you said it would be seasonal. I thought, you know, and the one thing we've learned is that this COVID pandemic continues to teach us new things. So anybody that says, well, we know it's going to go away by September or it's not going to come back until the fall everything we heard, including myself, you know, as numbers went down in June and July was, well, it'll come, maybe it'll come back in the fall or the winter. We're not there. So part of advocating Dr. Asbar, I think is helping people understand just how much transmission is going on. And, you know, we all have trouble seeing exponential growth, right? We all know kind of doubling and we go from two to four to eight, but this exponential number of, we have a hundred cases and then we have a thousand cases and then we have 10,000 cases is hard to conceptualize. So it starts, I think, with helping people understand that we have a lot of transmission even though we have a really high rate of vaccination for those who are eligible, there are still a quarter million people in DuPage County who are not vaccinated by choice or because they're not eligible. And so as we look at these restrictions and not even restrictions, right? Common sense ways to protect ourselves and those around us, um, helping people understand why that's so important, you know, may start with showing them the data about just how, how bad it is again. Chris, do you know anything about um, when, when, 
if and when boosters are recommended for the immunocompromised as an example, um, is there any guidance about um, how those individuals are identified? Is there gonna be any like higher level uh, need for a provider or others to recommend it? Or how do we separate that out? Because I imagine we'll get requests. Yeah, it's a great question and one for everybody today to be thinking about because the news out last night is, okay, everybody's eligible. Officially, the advisory community immunization practice meets this afternoon and will make specific recommendations. That's often the group that says, okay, here's exactly what we mean. Here are the people we mean who need that higher level of protection. Uh, it's solid organ transplants. It's people with active cancer therapy. It's people with you know immune autoimmune diseases. So there will be some more granularity in who that is recommended for. And I think that, yes, the first level is going to be, you know, having individuals who have that condition to be able to connect with their regular care provider um, first and foremost. And that'll be a lot of people. Of course, there are plenty of people that don't have that regular source of care um, that we're going to need to be ready to address. And we expect to have more information to, to be able to share early next week to say, here's what it looks like. Here's where you should go. Here's who's going to have that vaccine and be able to administer it. Um, and we'll have a lot more to share right now. It's a good question, though. Because every floodgates open now, right? Everybody hears the news and says, "Okay, I want to go get mine." <laughs> we're uh, we're at ten thirty three. We're a little bit past our time. I want to thank everybody for coming together this morning. Thanks for this incredible uh, sharing of resources. Um, I I feel that stomach punch, Chris. But on the other hand, we're a different community than we were a year and a half ago. Now we're seeing in real time what's happening. We're understanding it better. We're understanding the steps that we can take to prevent. And um, I, uh, DuPage County, the health department, uh, this team have done so much to prevent the spread of the disease, to prevent the severity, to prevent death, and to do that in a way that um, the entire community benefits. We're in such a better place for this slash of the of the virus pool than we would have been had we not been getting together. So I, I thank all of you. I wanna leave you, if I could, with um, a, a poem that I find is inspiring for me. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, it's a Gwendolyn Brooks poem. I wonder if you're able to see that. Speech to the young. Um, I always thought this was about children. But uh, the more I go through my own aging and the more I go through COVID, the more I realize it's about so much more than that. Um, so this is what I leave you with. I encourage you, if you have not heard of this poem before, uh, look it up somewhere. Um, it's it's a, a thing of great beauty. C can anybody see that well enough to read it? And anybody would like to... Take a crack at it out loud. I can. I could use it after that stomach punch. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Say to them, say to the downkeepers, the sun slappers, the self spoilers, the harmony hushers, even if you're not ready for day, it cannot always be night. You will be right, for that is the hard home run. Live not for battles won, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. Thanks, all. I wish you a good weekend and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you thanks, all. Everybody.